I'm Lisa Dwyer, and welcome to Mortgage 101. I have been a licensed loan officer and in this business for over 13 years. I've seen the ups and downs of the real estate market. I've seen really high rates and now really low rates. And when it push comes to shove, what really matters is that I love my job and it's exciting to me either helping people with purchasing a home or helping them with a refinance and lowering their rates or their term and saving them hundreds of dollars a month. It's very rewarding to me. So thanks for joining us. My goal for the show is to educate you in a fun and interesting, exciting format. Well, exciting for me, but hopefully for you as well. Um, I am trying to bring in as many professionals as I can to try and educate you the different processes of a mortgage. Today we have a wonderful man, um, the owner of Liberty Title, Tom Richardson. He is also an attorney. I'm, I'm excited today we're going to talk about um, some real estate transferred and how it's tacked. Last episode we discussed uh, who can hold t title to real estate, how they hold title, the different types of corporation, LLCs. So today's going to be a great show. Sometimes I'll start to talk too fast or we'll use words that are much too big and you may miss something, but we do have all of our information on paper for your request. If you request it, we'll give it to you free of charge. We'll either email it or, or send it in the mail. You can go to mtg101.net and or call 248-627-7283 and we'd be happy to ship you off the uh, transcript of today's show. Um, I guess last week we talked about, just to, just to briefly give an episode uh, preview or recap of what we did last week, just so we can go in and start today. Go ahead. Yes, Tom. well last week, Lisa, we uh, reviewed the t various types of tenancies, the joint tenancy, tenancy in common, tenancy by the entireties, trusts, corporations, etc. the different ways people can hold title to real estate. Today we're going to talk about how title to real estate is transferred to people. Right, and how, yes, and how, how you guys do it as the title company, correct? Correct, yes. Okay. Yeah. Um, basically, there are three ways title to property gets transferred in Michigan. It's either done by a deed, it's done by a court order, or it's done by operation of law. And uh, these are the three methods of moving title to real estate. Uh, starting off with deeds, um, there are basically three types of deeds that are recognized in Michigan, the warranty, covenant, and quit claim. And each one does things differently, and it's very significant about which type of deed you get. And that's a question people come in and they ask, I would like to transfer title or deed, or you know, and I tell them, go see you go to Liberty Title, see what kind of um, forms, that, and they're very easy forms to fill out yep. for the client. They're easy to fill out, but it's very important that the people know exactly what each form does because they can get in pretty severe trouble if they use the wrong form. The most common form we use uh, of deed transfer is what's known as a warranty deed. Yes. And this is called for in the standard real estate purchase contract. And what a warranty deed is, is pretty much what it says. It is a, a document where the seller gives the purchaser a warranty of title, saying, basically, I own the property, and nothing affects the title to the property except the items that I've accepted from my warranty. Um, items that ex would be accepted from a warranty are usually, say, things like building and use restrictions or utility easements, which the purchaser wants the property right. to have. Um, and if there are other items that uh, affect title that are not accepted by, uh, from the warranty, the purchaser has a cause of action, can sue the seller uh, for breach of the warranty. Well, and I know there's different um, exceptions. You mentioned exceptions. So talk, to, talk a little bit about um, what is that like if they were to, a seller would, would want the exception. Explain that a little bit. Yeah. Well, what the seller does is you start from the position that giving a basic warranty that there's nothing that affects title. But very little real estate in Michigan has nothing affecting the title because we've been around for a long time. You know, 50 years ago, the developer put a restriction on the use of the property that said only homes can be built here. You can't have commercial businesses. Uh, Is that part of like a zoning thing? No, it's, it's, it's a private contract that's recorded. 
Zoning does affect how you use your real estate, but building restrictions are private contracts between the owners of adjoining lands uh, that gives you a private right of action to enforce things. Uh, we had a major case in Ann Arbor a few years back where someone was operating a fairly large daycare facility uh, in a residential neighborhood. Uh, it was permitted under the zoning ordinance, but it was not permitted under the building restrictions and the neighbors successfully uh, closed it down because it was pretty disruptive in the neighborhood. Oh, well, and it's, and it's good to know that we, they, people can go to an attorney at the title company and, and discuss these types of things to find out what is their best um, action. Yep. What's their step? Um, mm -hmm. Now, what, what other types of deeds are they? And the co you know, the well, the covenant deed yeah. is probably, um, it's something that's really come to the fore now. And a covenant deed is uh, a, a deed with very limited warranties. It basically says that I, the seller, have not encumbered title to the property, and I will warrant title as to anything, anyone who claims that I gave them an interest. Uh, it's much more limited warranty than a general warranty deed, and why we've seen a lot of those is because of the foreclosure markets. Uh, lenders who foreclose on property really have no knowledge about it. Uh, they are not willing to execute a general warranty of title, uh, so they force the purchaser into accepting a covenant deed. Um, in a covenant deed instance, the purchaser has to get title insurance. We had this really brought home statewide earlier this year, or late last year, uh, when a Michigan Court of Appeals voided thousands of foreclosures uh, because of a, a, an alleged defect in the foreclosure. People who had bought homes from the foreclosing lender and had gotten a covenant deed, for, and the lender had transferred the properties to HUD, if they got a covenant deed from HUD, they weren't unable to sell or mortgage their property. It sounds like um, it's quite a, a risk for the purchaser, and I want to get into that a little bit. And, and when we return, um, we want to thank you for watching Mortgage 101. This is Tom Richardson. I'm Lisa Dwyer, and we're trying to explain about uh, conveying, recording, taxes, everything to help you uh, really protect your biggest asset, your home. So we'll be right back. Um, I'm program director. Uh, production supervisor. Producer, editor. Mm. All right, Mr. Tweedle, are you ready? I'm an editor at Oxford Community Television. Oh. I am the station manager. What? We're rolling. <laughs> I'm proud to be a producer here at Oxford Community Television. Action. What do you do at OCTV? I do science in the news and auto talk. Politicians! I'm sorry, I didn't say the right things. What do I do? I'm a jack of all trades. Actually, I almost got to play a dead body. You, get more, you made more money if you played a dead body. I love working here. I graduated from Bell and Howell. I went to school for it. Team player here. Hi, Kelly. Hey. <laughs> and I bring all the shows that you watch together. I've been a business for 40 years. I've uh, been a production manager, I've been a program manager, I've been a general manager. A, B, C, D, E, F, G. Wham! Wham! <laughs> I'm a big part of the Addison Living Show. OCTV has some of the most imaginative people working here. You can take a story and turn it into something visual. I'm constantly an individual who wants to learn things. I do this because we are your voice. You know, I love to do music stuff here with OCTV. I love enthusiasm. I love people who enjoy their job. He can do that. Anything about broadcasting, I, I just really loved it. We want you. I am. 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 I am OCTV. 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 I am OCTV.
We can do this. Thank you for watching and welcome back to Mortgage 101. We are here trying to educate you and protect your biggest asset, your home. I'm Lisa Dwyer. This is Tom Richardson with Liberty Title. And we're just going to go over quickly about a quick claim deed um, and what it means to our consumers, our clients. Yeah. I know that you covered quit claims largely in another episode, but basically a quit claim is a deed that says, I'm conveying to you whatever interest in the property I may or may not have. I could give you a quit claim deed to the Golden Tower of the Fisher Building. <laughs> I have no interest in it, but I can still give you a quit claim. Um, quit claims get abused. They really only should be used in two circumstances. One, when you're unsure of ownership, like an exchange of quit claim deeds between neighbors when they're not sure where the boundary is. Uh, and secondly, in a situation where you have to transfer title and there are unpaid real estate taxes. Um, if you give a deed with a covenant of warranty in it, uh, you have to get a certificate from the treasurer that there are no delinquent taxes. Um, very often we see this a lot with City of Detroit, City of Flint properties. Uh, the people don't want to pay the taxes at a closing, they, but they do want to transfer. Then you use a quit claim deed, but other than that, you don't want to break the chain of title by uh, not having a warranty deed. How, how and why would I record my deed? Okay, it's the, the how is pretty simple. Uh, you prepare a document in accordance with Michigan statute. You name the parties, precise description of the property, certain size paper, certain typeface. It's got to be in black ink, not purple ink. <laughs> oh, uh, I like red. Come on. Yeah, we get those back when we email <laughs> deeds to people and they print them on a printer. Um, and then you take it down to the Register of Deeds office, uh, pay the recording fee, and uh, the document goes on the public record, which everyone in the world is deemed to know then. Because it's recorded. It is public yep. record. And that's why you record it, is because everyone is deemed to know sure. the um, uh, contents of the Office of the Register of Deeds. Um, what about ex ex exemptions? Yeah, well... I, I um, understand that, you know, there are certain things that uh, will affect the deed. And I guess what we want you to do is just kind of explain um, what, what those are. Yeah, well, when you record a deed, the recording fees are pretty low here in Michigan. $14 for the first page, 3 for each additional. That's great. However, that if you're transferring price. real estate for value, if there's a cash consideration, uh, unless an exemption applies, you have to pay a very steep real estate transfer tax of eight sixty per thousand uh, dollars of value. So on a one hundred thousand dollar home, you have to pay an eight hundred and sixty dollar tax when you record your deed. Now there are a number of exemptions from the tax, and uh, a good attorney can point you at them. Uh, oh, I know a good attorney. <laughs> <laughs> well, tra tra transfers example from a uh, husband to a wife if they both already are entitled. A parent to a child gets you out of the transfer tax uh, of seven dollars fifty cents, um, and then uh, transfers for uh, straightening boundary disputes, etc. Key thing is looking for consideration on the deed. If there's consideration in money or money's worth, a tax applies unless there's an exemption. Now you uh, you spoke of uh, court orders. Yeah. Uh, court orders are the other way title transfers in Michigan. The circuit court is empowered under the Michigan Constitution to transfer title to real estate. And, you know, the most common way this happens is in a divorce proceeding where one property, uh, it, the property is awarded to one of the two parties. There can be condemnation proceedings, for example, when the state builds, wants to build a highway, the state can condemn or take part of your property and a court order will move the title from you to the state. 
And then last but not least, there's the quiet title action where a party who owns property that it's subject to some interests that they need to get rid of. Does it like clear up the flaws? It clears up the flaws in title. The most common quiet titles we get are uh, tax foreclosed properties. When people buy mm -hmm. property from the county treasurer, they usually get a quit claim deed so the title's not insurable and a title company will request that they go in and quiet the title, get a court order saying that the former no owner no longer has any interest in the property because due process was followed in the tax sale. Now what about, um, there's so many, there's so much information regarding title and, and, and this type of um, information is very confusing. I mean, I do mortgages for a living and it still is very, uh, it's a lot of information. So Liberty Title does know, you know, what you have to do and how to do it in the proper way and they have attorneys on staff. So if there's something that you're not understanding, feel free to call us at 248-627-7283 or go to our website at mtg101.net and we will point you to Liberty Title where they can help you with this mm -hmm. information. Well, and if anyone has a quick question, I've got the world's easiest email. I'm simply tom at libertytitle, all one word, dot com. Please feel free <laughs> to email a question Easy to enough, me. right. Now, what is transfer um, of operation, by operation of law? What does that mean? Okay, a transfer by operation of law is one that just is deemed by uh, the laws of the state of Michigan to occur upon a, uh, the occurrence of a certain event. Uh, for example, the joint tenancies we discussed in our last episode, when one joint tenant dies, their interest transfers automatically by operation of law to the surviving joint tenant. Right. Another example would be if two corporations merge, all the property of the corporation that will go away after the merger is deemed by operation of law to be in the other corporation. So those are the most simple ones. Sure. Um, and again, a terrible mistake people make, they get married and they think there's been a transfer by operation of law doesn't happen. If you get married and want to retitle your real estate, you need to do a deed. Right, right. Now is there anything else you do when you want to transfer real estate? Um, yes, there is one other document in Michigan that you do need to file. It's called a property transfer affidavit. That'll be our document of the day. And that needs to be filed with your tax assessor within 45 days of the transfer or you face up to a $200 fine. So it, there are some very important key uh, terms here that we were learning today. And um, Tom is so educated. At, like I said, he is the attorney and owner of Liberty Title. And we just want to try and, and educate you on your biggest asset, your home. So be right back. We're going to talk about the document of the day. We're going to talk about the assessor and um, lots of great information for you. The American Legion, we're a powerful force for the nation. We're patriots through and through. We believe in our flag and all that it stands for. Our constitution, our pledge of allegiance, our way of life are all fundamental to maintaining our freedom and the standing that we have as the greatest country on earth. We promote and defend these values every day in communities across the nation. Go to legion.org to find out more about the American Legion's commitment of service to America. I've always appreciated the American Legion. My gratitude to the American Thank Legion. Thank you all of the American Legion. We have millions of veterans that are members of our organization. Thank you. The American Legion, celebrating a legacy of service to America. Find out more at legion.org. The American Legion, we're a powerful force for the nation. We're the largest veteran service organization in the nation, with two and a half million members. And when you add to that the American Legion Auxiliary and the Sons of the American Legion, we have a family of four million members, working hard every day for our veterans, our youth, and our communities. Go to legion.org to find out more about the American Legion's commitment of service to America.
Welcome back and thanks for watching Mortgage 101. I'm Lisa Dwyer and I'm here today with Tom Richardson and we're talking about uh, title and conveyance and taxes. And uh, right now we're going to finish up the show with talking about um, the assessor. And what does the assessor do with the PTA? Okay, well the assessor takes the PTA Which is? and the property transfer affidavit, one of our two documents of the day, and they use it for two things. One, uh, they use it in their valuation process of real estate, although it's a very complicated formula. This is one of the factors to set the taxable value of the real estate. And more importantly, they use it to see whether or not the property taxes uncap, that there's been a transfer that allows the assessor to reassess the property and bring it to its full taxable, va full fair market value. Um, the PTA contains on the top part of the form the information about the actual transfer that's occurred and then the bottom half of the form is a series of exemptions from the uncapping law. So the property transfer affidavit, here we have a copy for you and it's, it's very simple, it's a simple form to fill out but it really does hold a lot of information and viable for uh, your property. Correct. So the top here shows just the streets. Uh, the transfer, the purchase price of the real estate, if it's a city, township, or village, uh, the identification number. Now, what what is exactly the property identification number? That, that's the that's the number used by the assessor for the property tax bill, and which uh, everyone just received, right? Yes. <laughs> and they got their um, their taxable value. Mm -hmm. uh, we're we're really excited to talk about that in a future show because people don't understand. They see their their bill come in or their assessed value. And it says fifty-five thousand, but they think their house is worth eighty or ninety, and it's really mm -hmm. not truly their value of their home. Right under Michigan law, there are two numbers the assessor calculates. There's the SEV or state equalized value, which is supposed to be half of your current market value, and the second is the taxable value, which is the value that the local real estate taxes are calculated on. And taxable value is almost always lower than SEV because it can only go up by the rate of inflation uh, or 5%, whichever is less, if property values are rising. Now, unfortunately, we just had a tough right. spell here yeah. uh, where values fell, and a lot of SEVs and TVs are the same now because of the decline in values. Well, and, and I don't want people to uh, misconstrue the, the idea that their SEV is their actual value. No. The only way to find that is an appraisal. The only way, yeah, is to get an appraisal on it. And quite honestly, there's a bias in the system. If the assessor sets the value too high, you're going to file a property tax appeal and create more work for the assessor. So there's sort of a bias to yes. have that be a little low so it doesn't send you storming down to the assessor's office. And there office. is a meeting. They have a general meeting. I believe it's the end of February. You can check with them. Um, Correct. The your, Board of Review. Yes, yes, where you can go in and state your case. Yep. And most of the time they'll want you to bring some proof with you, uh, maybe some comparables or, or things like that so that you have an actual, everybody wants their home to, to appraise and be worth more than it is, right? Yeah. Because that's your money. That's your assets. <laughs> Yeah, the only, the only time you want the value to be lower than what it really is is tax time. So, <laughs> Right, just like, just like when you uh, show your income to the IRS, right? Same kind of thing. Well, um, okay, so let's go over our second document today, and, um, and that is the, um, the real estate, the principal residence exemption affidavit. Yeah. Propos let's talk about this yeah. for just a Th second. This is an incredibly important document because under Michigan law, a person's personal residence, the place that they abide in and consider their principal home, uh, is taxed at a significantly lower rate uh, than other real estate. And what you need to do to create a personal residence exemption is take this form, complete it, file it with the local assessor. Uh, it goes into a database with the state to make sure you don't have two principal residences. Um, Right, and, and thus going into homestead versus non-homestead, correct? Right. And homestead is when you live, it's your primary residence, you live in the residence. Right, the cottage up north, that gets taxed at the full rate. The one down homestead. here where you live is taxed at the principal residence rate. There is one minor exception to the law that applies, 
the legislature came through to help homeowners in this real estate crisis where if you have moved to a new home in Michigan, you can continue a principal residence exemption on your old home uh, as long as you've got it listed for sale and not rented. That way it'll help keep the taxes from right, skyrocketing. Right, because uh, the difference between a homestead and non-homestead tax bill is pretty, it's a pretty huge difference. Yeah, you're talking thousands of dollars. Yeah, when people come in, they, they're out looking for homes and they're all excited and they found their dream home and they come to me and say, Lisa, I really want this house. And I have to look at something called debt ratio and I say, okay, the house that you're looking for is 100,000, it fits your realm. However, the taxes are $7,000. How does a house in Oxford have a $7,000 tax bill? Well, we look down a little further and it says non-homesteaded tax. Therefore, I have to tell my client, the person who's just loving this house and wants it so bad, that we have to get the actual amount of the homesteaded taxes to see if they're able to afford the home because the non-homesteaded taxes blows their debt to income out of the water and they cannot purchase the home. Yeah, that's been a terrible problem with it the is foreclosure crisis. It is so terrible. Because a bank obviously doesn't have a a principal residence, so all those bank owns yes. are taxed at the higher Anything rate. Anything bank owned right now is non-homesteaded, which affects the the in, the tax um, that's on your listing. So, and it's also um, a, a miscommunication, or the realtors need to let people know as well. Hey, this is not your actual tax bill. It will become less. And when does that when does that happen? Let's say I buy a house in January and it's non-homesteaded. What happens to me? Well, the law has just changed, and basically, if you buy in January, you're in good shape because if you close, you know, it, your tax bills are not going to come out till July or December. And there are now two homestead deadlines, May 1 and November 1, where you can come into play and file a homestead, and it will knock the next tax bill down to a lower rate. Ah. So if you buy a foreclosed property prior to May 1 this year, you're only going to pay homestead taxes, assuming you file the form correctly. Right. Well, that's what we're going to leave that up to Liberty Title to do for us, <laughs> <laughs> to make sure we are doing that uh, the legal way, the right way. And um, there is so much that, uh, Tom, it's just amazing. Thank you so much for coming. Well, thanks and for the opportunity. Lisa. Yeah, there's so much information uh, that you as a consumer needs to keep in mind when you're purchasing a home or refinancing or if you're getting a divorce or doing a trust or adding a more, you know, a will, a trust. There's so much information and we try to educate you because it is overwhelming. We, um, we, I do get excited and talk really fast and, and we use some terms that you're not used to hearing so you are able to get all of this in writing by just going online at mtg101.net or calling the office and if you have a scenario that is really, you feel is different than anything we've talked about, we would be happy to help you and try to steer you in the way that will behoove you in the most favorable manner. So um, I'm really excited. Thanks so much for watching. This is great fun for me because I love to help people and this is my joy and uh, trying to save you some money and, and find you uh, the best possible way to uh, protect your biggest and best asset, your home. So thanks for watching Mortgage 101 and thank you Tom for coming and God bless.